live on YouTube, so we're formally engaged in a continuation of House Appropriations uh, afternoon meeting. <clears throat> we're pleased to have the Agency of Education and Secretary French with us, and we also have <clears throat> Brad James. I'm looking around the squares, and we have um, Kathy Flanagan with us, and also Candace Elmquist. And we, the, the governor's presentation is hot off the press. And so we have not had a chance to really dive into many areas. And so much of what, much that we will hear from you today, um, we, we have not had a chance to review. So we are going to look at the, um, at the agency's budget. But if there's time, if you could give us an update on the, the $50 million, um, how, how, you know, for the HVAC system, and the summer meals and how that money is going out and any other um, pressures that you see within, <clears throat> within our education system, that would be great. But let's take off the table first. Let's get the budget done for the agency and then we can um, jump into those other areas that, that we'd like to know a little more about. So Teresa will uh, share the screen with your documents. And so Secretary French, if you would like to and, and tell us what you would like to have up and where you are on, on the documents so we can follow them. That would be helpful. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to see you all. We do have members of our team, notably uh, Bill Bates, who's our new CFO, um, Kathy Flanagan. Excuse me? I missed him. I'm sorry. I didn't see <laughs> That's all right. Uh, he's, ironically, he's going to be the, the person in the hot seat for most of this, but uh, Bill's been our CFO uh, for a bit now. He's doing a great job. Um, so Bill Bates, CFO, Kathy Flanagan, long-serving member of our agency, deputy CFO, and Brad James, our school finance, one of our school finance experts. So have our, our core leadership team on finance here with you today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just unplug my headset for a second. And I don't wanna be remiss. I need to welcome the House Education Committee is also joining us. Just, uh, can and you hear me okay? so, yes, we can, uh, Secretary French. I did want to note that the House Education Committee is joining appropriations so that we can expedite the, uh, the budget process, and I want to welcome them. And please uh, write down your questions, and as soon as there's breaks in the presentation, if you have questions, just put up your virtual hand, and we will make sure that uh, they are asked. So welcome to everyone. Go ahead, Secretary French. So we'll work from the slide uh, presentation that you see and Teresa put on the screen. Um, we elected to, to use basically the same presentation that we had presented to you previously in the spring. We just updated it for our restatement of our budget. So just so you could see the, the complete sort of format, um, you know, once again, the Agency of Education, firstly, is not funded by the Education Fund to the most extent. So that's the first point we always uh, sort of have to put out there, but we're happy to, with Brad here, particularly talk about the Education Fund. Um, but also the point I'd make is that uh, our, our overall operations are not uh, significantly supported by the General Fund either. You know, we have a lot of federal grants and programs and so forth. So um, as we were contemplating working on a restated budget over the summer, um, it's not perhaps as challenging as some other agencies in terms of navigating uh, sort of our budget targets and goals, uh, but certainly, um, as you know, the agency has had uh, reductions in staff over the years, um, and that's something we've been building back capacity on, and uh, we can speak uh, more to that directly. One of the key areas you'll see in this restatement is um, we moved our data division to be under the CFO sort of area to start to put together sort of an operations core team, but that's just merely a reorganization piece. So why don't I turn it over to um, our CFO, Bill Bates, to walk you through a uh, specific issue. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Uh, for the record, Bill Bates, Agency of Education. And uh, Teresa, if you would be so kind as to uh, advance to slide three. So team, this is uh, what uh, Secretary French was referring to on uh, slide three. We show the governor's original recommended FY21 budget. And that is across all 12 appropriations and it's $1.977 billion. And then as Secretary French mentioned, we went through a uh, budget exercise this summer and Teresa, if I can have you advance to slide four. 
Kitty, if I may, just briefly, this is Peter. Yes, Peter. Um, is, can you just clarify, because we don't deal with education a lot, and I don't know what F&A and ES means, you know, the acronyms that you use. Sure. Thank you for uh, asking the question. So F&A would be finance and administration. ES would stand for education services. AEL would be adult education and literacy. Does that help? Yes, it does. I had myself yeah. muted again, so thank you. <laughs> That's quite all right. And so we're on now on slide four, and you can see from the uh, the executive summary here, we were uh, able to reduce five hundred and two thousand dollars from the originally submitted budget, which is about three percent. And you can see by appropriation how we came up with those savings. There is a uh, net reduction of one hundred and twenty-seven thousand in finance and admin, one hundred and eighty-three for education services and so on and so forth. The key point I wanna highlight here is that uh, as Secretary French mentioned, we also have a restatement uh, where we're reclassifying the uh, data team, data and analysis from education services over to finance and admin. And that's $6 million, which uh, we will highlight uh, in the slides to come. Any questions on slide four before I move on? Excuse me, Bill, that is not a reduction, the six million, that's just moving it from one area to another. Is that, that correct? That is correct, yes. Thank you for that. Okay. I was gonna... you do the reductions by appropriations, will you tell us the impact those reductions will have so we understand where the reductions are coming from and yes. by administration and flexible pathways that we fully understand. Thank you. Absolutely. So I wanted to give you a very high level executive summary. And then as we go through the slides, we'll drill into the details so that you can see okay. how. We're going to do. Uh, could I just uh, go back, go back to that slide. I just want to point out uh, the state board item in particular, something perhaps for the committee to follow up on. So the State Board of Education uh, previously was embedded in our budget. We sort of broke them out as their own standalone area. Um, their budget, I think previously was closer to $80,000, but they elected at some point uh, during the year not to uh, join their national organization. So that savings is 24,000 by not paying their dues. I'll just make the point that um, we haven't, uh, this is our budget proposal from the administration side, but the State Board of Education might, you might wanna consult with them to see what they, they think in terms of that reduction. I, I, I'm sure they don't support it. Uh, they've been an advocate of uh, getting additional revenues to support their activities. Um, but from my perspective, as we were contemplating reductions across the board, um, I didn't feel comfortable not uh, making a proposal. So what I did is I included their, uh, their reduction based on their discontinuation of their national dues. Did they agree to the discontinuation of the national dues? They have no interest, I believe, uh, in continuing that affiliation. However, I think they would disagree with having their budget cut by that amount. Uh, Thank you. They, would, they would prefer to use those funds for other support of their other activities. Thank you for that clarification. Other questions before we go to the next slide? I think we're ready to continue. Thank you. Teresa, if we could go to the next slide. And so this is uh, going to uh, do a deeper dive into the overview of the agency structure and the uh, operation. And if we can advance the next slide, Teresa. This is uh, where we were highlighting the uh, reclassification of the data and assessment team. If you see, this is how we originally were structured when we submitted our proposed budget back in February. And if you look, look at the lower left-hand corner of this org chart, data and data management is in under uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher. And Teresa, if we move to the next slide, we can see that we've highlighted the uh, fact that we've moved them now under the, uh, the CFO. Teresa, the next slide. This slide is, uh, should be familiar to many, if not most of you. This is our uh, presentation slide from uh, back in February. And it highlights, if you take a look at the uh, 
green line that goes across the staffing at the agency from 2008 to the current year. We're, uh, we're right, about, right about at 159 full-time employees in FY21. That is down from a total of 213 in FY08. And there's been a number of uh, reasons for that swing. Uh, one of the big ones was the fact that uh, IT used to be embedded in the agencies that has since been taken out. And as you know, we now have ADS. And then there was the, uh, what I refer to from my uh, private sector days, the financial tsunami, if you will. And that had an impact on resource as well. So that's bringing us from the 213 down to the 159 that you see on this slide. There's no questions there. We can advance to the next slide. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure there's no questions. I'm not. Thank you. I, I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Just have, like, you know, how many of the, of the positions are positions that um, exist but are unfilled? Great question. Kathy, do you have the exact number from HR? I, I'll, this is Dan. I'll chime in. Um, I believe we're around 10 vacancies, uh, which is where. You know, we brought that down, I think, a year or and a half or so ago, we were at as high as like 25 vacancies. So we were down, I would say, the normal sort of attrition or vacancy savings level of about 10 positions. So uh, does the 159 reflect positions or, or filled positions? I believe it's positions. Total positions, total positions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have two other I hands guess. raised. Uh, I have a question from Representative Hooper and then Lanfer. Hi, I was going to ask this later. I see that since we're talking about vacancies, it appears to me that you're proposing additional vacancy savings later on. If you're already carrying 10 of uh, what, 159, that's a pretty significant vacancy allocation already. How's this going to affect your operations? What are you not doing as a result of this? Secretary French, did you want to uh, respond to that? Maybe Kathy can drill into that a little more specifically, if you could. Sure, I'll try. So the bulk of the agency vacancies at this point, I believe there are two in education services. The rest of the vacancies are in the finance and administration area. And those are positions that we have been working to reclass since the agency did its um, reorganization of finance and administration starting when Bill came on. So that's what's driving those. Um, the, we had in our original budget submission in February, we had a 3% vacancy savings built in there that we already had to meet. And so the amount on our restatement for additional vacancy savings um, is simply a calculation of the first several months of FY21 um, while we are waiting for the, for permission to fill those finance positions. So we, we're calculating that we will be able to meet the original budgeted vacancy savings. And then um, those positions hopefully will be hired in the next six to nine weeks. Does that answer the question? I... I, I got confused, um, but it is, I'm sure because I don't understand your budget. Um, so you're carrying 10 vacancies now. You're looking to have them reclassified and, and they will go into finance and administration. And I think you just said that you are hoping to fill them within the next X period of time, next several weeks. It, are they now accounted for within your budget? Yes. The cost of those? 
Yes. So those 10 are going to be filled. And so the 18,000 that we're seeing in vacancy savings is just kind of a continuation of the, what I would consider the normal vacancy savings that any large issue organization has. Correct. And I think if I, if I chime in, I think the difference between our original proposal was the, as a result of the hiring freeze. So we had uh, slightly an increase here to our vacancy savings because of the first couple of months of this fiscal year um, as a result of the freeze that was enacted. If I'm correct, Kathy? Yes, that's correct, Dan. But your proposed full year budget will cover the cost of filling those additional positions. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're just holding them for six to nine weeks to reach this savings. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are they, do you have people that would fill them now or is, is it not? No, just we are in the process right now of getting the um, administration HR approval under the hiring freeze rules. We have a question from Representative Lamper and then Representative Iacovoni. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could tell me how many of the uh, positions that were moved that were IT that are now in uh, ADS. Gives me a little bit more of a sense of, is it two, 20? No, there were 10. There were 10. Okay. And thank you. Um, Dave? Yes, thank you. Would you please go back to slide four, the previous slide, please? I just had a question on the uh, adult education. I think it's a $108,000 reduction. There yep. is adult ed and literacy. Um, about 20% of your total reduction. Can you, can you uh, help me understand a little bit of the impact of that reduction, please? Um, Dan, do you want me to jump in with some information about the grant lines that are involved there? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, so 81,000 was a reduction to the actual provider grants. We have five providers in the state for adult education. And there was an there is a proposed $81,000 reduction to the provider um, grants. And then the adult diploma program has a reduction of 27,000. And we did check those numbers with our um, leadership in those programs and Deputy Secretary Boucher, and they felt confident that the providers would be able to absorb that level of reduction. That's the 3% um, because of shifts that happen between all of the various adult services that are available between um, early college, dual enrollment, it does shift the population of where they're accepting their services. So the agency believes that that 3% um, reduction in adult ed and literacy will um, be fine with the providers. Will that be distributed evenly among all five providers? I believe so. I'm not in charge of allocating the program people are, but I believe it would be even, evenly distributed based on um, the current distribution, which is probably more in line with the number of students that they serve. And so there already is a difference between the regions based on the number of students served. And while we're here, could you just briefly speak to the 183,000 reduction in education services. I don't think I caught that the first time. Um, yes, so we had proposed. Kathy, Kathy, just before you do that, are we going to see a slide on each one of these reductions that explains it? Or do we? We do break it down. We do break it down. Okay, I just wanted to make sure before we went through all Enough. of them. We can, we can certainly answer. So thank you. Out. No, if it comes up later in your presentation, thank you. I'll, I'll withhold any questions so we can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I think we'll, we'll, we'll do the questions as we see each of them independently. 
Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to uh, slide nine? No, I think our questions will come when, um, as you go through the slides, but as we get to each one of those 5% redu or 3% reductions. Thank you. Absolutely. So if we advance to slide nine, this is just showing you the two main appropriations, finance and admin, and what makes that up, uh, communications, legal, finance, and administration, and then data management. And then under education services, you've got federal education and support programs, student support, education quality, and then student pathways. Those are the two main appropriations. And Teresa, if we can advance to slide 10. And this is where we start drilling into the, the details. This is uh, finance and administration. And you can see that uh, we've got uh, five components that make up the, uh, the change. Internal service funds represents $57,853 of the reduction. We have supplies of 852. We talked briefly previously about vacancy savings, that's 18,762. And then the fourth line item, contracts. Our legal uh, counsel has indicated that uh, there is uh, a contract that uh, her team will no longer need that, that is a, a savings of 18,000. And then we are able to reduce our uh, contract with Bruce team. And that represents a uh, $32,000 savings because the purchase order rolled over from the current year to the future year. And that makes up the 50,000. And then as I had mentioned on the executive summary, you can see the $6 million, that's the uh, data and assessment reclass coming over from education services to finance and administration. Okay, and so the $127,000 reduction is made up in, I'm trying to do the math quickly, in numbers one through four. That is correct. Okay, so Mary Hooper has a question. Yeah, thank you. You're the first budget that we've seen with the reduction in the internal service funds. So. I need to ask the question of what is, how is, is, were you assigned these reduction costs or break that out a little bit for us? Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, these, these numbers come from uh, finance and administration. Um, and so it's made up of all of the internal service fund charges. And so you've got uh, our property casualty insurance which was a $94 savings. Um, liability insurance was 1,000. HR was 1,400, and I'm rounding these numbers. Um, ADS, which is the IT allocation, that's 2,700. Workers' comp is 1,800, and then vision was the uh, 3,715. And then we had additional internal service charges that were uh, part of the reduction. And again, that is uh, made up of property and uh, liability insurance, the HR, IT, and vision. Kathy, anything else that you'd like to add to that? Those are the, those are the major components of the uh, internal service. Correct. Yep. So you're not seeing any reduction of services. What you're seeing is, is a reduction of the cost, I'm hoping, and that when we hear from HR and ADS and, and um, DFR, did the insurance pieces, are they coming through DFR service charges? Um, they come from BGS risk management. BGS, okay. Um, we will get, I'm hoping the details that will help us fully understand what these reductions mean. But before I move to Representative Lamfer, are you feeling any different services with any of these reductions? I'm not aware of any, Kathy, uh, anything that uh, you have insight on? No, I'm not aware of any. I believe the folks who are running the internal service accounts were given the same reduction instructions as all the rest of the agencies. And those are being passed on because we get the original anticipated cost from the administration. And this is just an extension of the passing on the reduction 
that we should see. We should not see a change in service, only cost. Thank you. Um, Maria, would you just, I'm sorry to do this while everyone's listening. Listening, um, would you, could you get us a list of all, all entities beyond ADS and BGS that have internal service funds so that when they come in, like with HR, we make sure to ask what the impacts are or how they came up with the savings? Please. This, I don't, I just need that list. Um, Representative Lamper. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. So this is a this is a very nice high level kind of refresher because we've been away, but we these are things that we're seeing. I'm interested to see too at some point. And we're all about the details here. Um, typically, and maybe it's because yeah. oh, my grandson just came in. Um, we see each like one of those steel. items at 57,000. Like what steel. made up that? So we can see whether it's workers comp and things. So that crosswalk breakdown, is that going to be coming at some point? That's a great question. I was under the impression that the, the detail had been shared. If it had not been shared, I can make sure that this gets uh, over to you so you can see that, uh, for example, I'm, I'm looking at the worksheet where it's talking, yeah. it is reduced by $94. Yeah, so I mean, typically, Bill, I, um, Mr. Bates, we get like a crosswalk that has a total at the N57, but it also has, we see each one of the, the reductions that we can, we can sort, start to feel comfortable about. Not only that, but although education is not the budget I have to bring to the floor, it's questions that we have to be prepared to answer from other members. The yep. first thing they're going to say is, what is that made up of? And why did that have to happen? And what was impacted because it's reduced. And, you know, and then I'll just leave with one other question and I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I'm just curious as to, as, as I would be, as we were trying to build a budget, we're trying to look at reductions 3%. Um, your understanding of why you were given the goal of 7% or 3% reduction. It's okay, Grandpa, he can stay for a minute, just so you don't have to wrestle. Does it, I'm just trying to get at like, if I'm working up a budget and I'm trying to find a 3% reduction, what, what, was there a reason for why you were finding that? So for, for clarification's sake, um, the original exercise to try to reduce our operating budget by 5% and then uh, the agency of administration came back uh, after they got better results and said that uh, we, we could go with a 3% reduction. And so the exercise for Kathy and I was to take a look working with uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher and Secretary French, identifying how we could come up with that 3% reduction across our administrative, uh, our, across our appropriations. And it's, it's difficult because we don't have a lot of general fund to begin with. And so obviously we took, we took full advantage of the internal service fund reductions, but then we actually had to take a look at the, 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 the budget. And that's where we came up with the uh, contractual savings, the supply savings. We're reducing some out of state travel, which is also adding up. But uh, Unfortunately, the, the real cuts in order to get to the 3% uh, are coming from grants, grant programs. And those, those we will see not here, but we'll see those in another slide. Yes, and as I had mentioned, I thought that the detail uh, breakdown line by line had been shared and uh, it sounds like it has not been shared. And so I will make sure to get that over to you so that you can see that crosswalk that uh, breaks down every single line. All right, so we st I know we're gonna, we're, it's gonna be a short turnaround for the, the whole budget, but it's still our, you know, our responsibility to help balance you know, um, the big picture as well. So, so it's really important to understand did the savings occur because it's just a natural $1,000 savings on a worker's comp? Or was it something that you had to hard fought to go and find? 
and what was the impact of it. So it kind of really makes us help help you to balance that as well as balancing when it was just a naturally organic occurring savings or one that was really um, fought fought to achieve. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you. Sorry, everybody, for my grandson's <laughs> or just arrived in. Um, He's three and doesn't really do quiet well. <laughs> I, was, I was just going um, to represent Lambert's question. This this exercise was more of your ladder, you know. I say exercise. You know, we're we're running in um, with a lot with not a lot of information in terms of what the long term financial impact of COVID will be. Um, so we're we're being cautious, and you know, we started at a five percent reduction, uh, but we felt more optimistic in one with three. But it was really starting from just a target to sort of approach to budgeting and, and we had to navigate that that aspect of it so As just a, to, just for clarity so that you so that you can get my full picture or my appreciate so we're just coming from this morning hearing about how it how there was a comfort in the administration's ability to use six million dollars for other things like mowing the lawns and, and, and to move it to transportation. So constantly as we're going through budgets, I'm going to be looking for, did this need to have to happen instead of that? Does that make sense? So yeah, just so you know where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I get you. I mean, I you know, I, I've worked with school budgets for many years. So I I, right. I I can smell the flavors of both here. And there's always, and this is a much more complex budgeting process, obviously, but um, I think, you know, it's a mix of trying to uh, know that we're going to be living within our means uh, and trying to find that comfort level while at the same time identifying those strategic opportunities that would allow us to add value. So that's in that sort of analysis happens across the enterprise of state government. So thank you. I just wanted you to uh, hear from a statement of from where I'm where I was coming from when I asked that question. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you, Diane. Um, and so for um, Chip Conquest uh, has the, the, the education budget, but also the education committee. You know, we've talked about the vacancy savings. The supplies is very small, but the contracts, what exactly do these uh, reductions mean? And uh, do we feel <clears throat> that they're made with no harm to the agency and that they're sustainable um, uh, reductions if need be? So let's move to the next set. So this is uh, education services. And again, you can see the, uh, the four lines that make up the, uh, the reduction. We have grants in the total of 124,841. We have uh, savings in travel. We have savings in vacancy savings. And then the data assessment uh, reclass is an offset of the uh, 6 million eight that you saw on finance and admin. And so on, on the particular grants we have, and again, I will make sure that uh, I share with Teresa the, uh, the detail that breaks down each of these by line item. Uh, but for the sake of conversation today, uh, the grants that we're looking to propose reductions to our uh, Governor's Institute Teacher of the Year, Outright Vermont, and Early Reading. So the Governor's Institute is being reduced by 5,780. Teacher of the Year is being reduced by 2,500. Outright Vermont is being reduced by 40,000. And then Early Reading is being reduced by 76,561. That's the makeup of the, uh, the grant reduction. Savings on, uh, on travel because of uh, the, the COVID incident. Uh, we are not doing any travel out of state. I've actually registered for a couple of conferences that have been canceled. And so that is a real savings where we won't be doing as much out of state travel. We don't anticipate that. And so we were able to reduce that without any uh, great pains. We had talked about the vacancy savings already. And then we also highlighted earlier in an earlier slide, the data and assessment reclass. Kathy, anything to add to the, the grants or anything as far as education services that I might have missed? Uh, nope, I think you listed them all. 
Hey, for the House Committee members, uh, either education or appropriation, are there any questions regarding uh, these uh, reductions? Representative Austin. Yes, I'm just wondering for the early uh, reading grant, is that uh, personnel that is being cut? No, it's my understanding, and Kathy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, the early reading grant of 76000 that has not been used in recent years. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Representative Hooper? I wasn't writing, <clears throat> excuse me, fast enough when you listed off the grant reductions. I lost you after Outright Vermont. So Outright Vermont was 40,000. Mm -hmm. And then early reading was 76,561. And just to confirm the other two, Governor's Institute, it's a reduction of 5,780. And then Teacher of the Year is a reduction of 2,500. And the detail that you're sending us will enable us to see what the total grants were as well as this reduction? Absolutely, yes. Okay. I have an action item to share that with Teresa. Okay, thank you. I can't help but assume, and so I shouldn't, um, that the reduction to outright Vermont is going to significantly affect their operations. Do you have any insight into that? Kathy, I will defer to you as far as... Um, I can give some history in that as well. Um, the, uh, they had previously, I believe, uh, received a $20,000 grant uh, from the agency, but it was through federal dollars that we had received and that funding stopped. And there was a, a little bit of a, I don't say, my, this is my characterization, a bit of a traffic jam of how that money went out. Uh, so in, 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 a, in a prior time, they had received sort of a chunk of that, uh, multiple years of the 20,000 all at once. So uh, we had notified them last year or the year before that the federal grant went away. Um, and the General Assembly addressed that by not um, giving them a separate appropriation for the, the typical 20,000, they gave them $60,000, and that was sort of an anomaly, um, you know, based on, once again, that sort of bulk of accumulating payments that went their way at one point. So uh, actually bringing it to 20,000 is what they're typically used to. Uh, the 60,000 was an anomaly, but I'd secondly say that um, previously all, all of that subsidy came from a federal grant that we no longer have. So this would be um, state dollars being used to support their work. Thank you. Uh, Representative Townsend and then Representative Lanfer. Uh, thank you. Uh, with regard to the cut to the Governor's Institute um, Institutes, is this going to be diminishing the number of students that may participate? I, I would say I, I'm not sure. I think, um, you know, it's certainly a very worthy program. Uh, We've struggled with finding ways to um, add to this appropriation over the years, but they also have a considerable amount of other financial resources coming in. But they're, you know, they're going to be reacting to the COVID-19 uh, environment, just like all our other educational programs are. So it's, I think, too early to say uh, to what extent how this would be um, impacting their operations. So there wasn't any. Let's see. How should I put this? So the amount by which their budget amount was cut was not based on any particular uh, rationale other than money needed to be found? That's correct. And also understanding that they have other revenue sources available to sustain their program. Thank you. Representative Lanfer. Sorry, Kitty, I have a perpetual habit of not re lowering my hand, so I apologize. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, does the House Education Committee members have any other questions? Okay, let's move to the next set of 3% um, reductions. And so this uh, next 
slide is a, a, a deeper dive and it shows the makeup of the $502,305. And uh, when I send over the, uh, the detailed line by line support crosswalk as you refer to it as, you'll, you'll be able to see for the internal service fund, 57,000, what makes that up? And then also we talked about the vacancy savings of 62,000. You'll see the two lines that make up the uh, contractual changes of 50,000. And then you'll see the individual lines that we just talked about that make up the grants. Travel is just a single line reduction. And then the other three components making up the $502,305. Teresa, can you bring that to the bottom? I don't see the full screen. Oh, okay, I see. This is just the, the roundup. And so that was the uh, presentation on the uh, exercise to identify a 3% reduction to the education general fund. And if there are any additional questions on that, we can take them now. I'm looking for questions. Uh, Representative Feltis? Yes, I'm curious about the AEL grants and the dual enrollment. Do you anticipate, is, is part of the reason you feel you can reduce those, you anticipate fewer participants due to, number one, the, CR, the coronavirus problem, as well as just inconvenience and lack of internet and all kinds of other reasons that you might have fewer participants during this next nine months for those programs. Kathy, did you wanna go into a deeper uh, explanation? We, we talked about what made up those two. It's uh, provider grants is being reduced by 81,150 and then adult diploma program is getting reduced by 27,000, which makes up 108,150. Yeah, the dual enrollment, we did a straight 3% um, to be in line with the exercise instructions. The 59,000 I should point out is a combination of general fund and ed fund because by statute dual enrollment program is 50% ed fund, 50% general fund. Um, so it would be 20, 29,000 from um, both of those funds. For dual enrollment, I would say that that is a statutory program that allows students to participate if they meet certain requirements. And there is really no way of predicting from one year to the next how many students may or may not elect to go the dual route and dual enrollment route in their education, so it was it was straight up a three percent exercise from that grant program. Kitty, I have a clarifying I, question. I can understand that, but it would seem to me in the current environment that perhaps there might be fewer participants in both of those programs simply because of isolation issues and because of poor internet issues, people not being able to participate as much in those programs in the, in the short term, in the next nine months, as an example. Yeah, I think there's no way, unless, um, uh, unless Secretary French can, can talk about remote learning work that the agency is doing, I don't know that there's a way that we can predict exactly what students um, will or won't choose to do this year. Yeah, I think, you know, my impression, okay. is we, especially, you know, we, we come at the end of the year and we sort of find out, sort of like special ed funding, we find out how much you need there was, uh, because as, as Kathy said, it's a statutory entitlement. Um, I, I, I don't have any insight into what the trends will be. Uh, I, I expect our infrastructure relative to broadband to continue to improve. Um, but it's hard really to predict how that will play out in the context of higher education. And, and we are deploying as you know, a lot more remote learning just for the regular K-12 curriculum. So I, 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 have, I have no ability even in any year to predict dual enrollment in this year. It's, I think it may be exceedingly uncertain in that regard. 
Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, Kate, I think you had a question or comment. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have access to my little blue hand, so I'm just yelling out of class here. Um, I just have a clarifying question on the vacancy savings. Are you saying that those vacancy savings are particularly related to holding those positions uh, and not filling for another six to eight weeks? Is, am I, did I understand that correctly earlier or, or not? Yes. I would, I would say, you know, Representative Hooper's summary was how I would summarize it as well. As like any large organization, we have a certain amount of vacancy savings. So this has remained more or less unchanged from our previous budgetary projection. However, we have included uh, the savings as a result of the hiring freeze. So it's our normal sort of wear and tear, if you will, on, on the churn of hiring. And you are going to HR at this point, I, I understand, to try to fill that. I, yeah, one of my concerns that remains is that certainly we know that the, the agency has uh, suffered a, a loss of, of staffing for a number of years and certainly before the pandemic. My concern here and, and interested in your response, um, we certainly know that since March, the, uh, the, the requests and the needs from districts have increased uh, to the agency. They're, they're looking for more help. I know that you turned your whole flexible pathways into remote learning. And I'm, I'm, I've, I've always been concerned about the, the lack of staffing that you have at the agency, but I'm really looking now uh, at, at a time where um, the needs are greater than they really have ever been. And if you are going to be considering looking for more support going forward. Yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, the, the impact of COVID is going to be long lasting. And one of the things we've done immediately is to try to automate our support. So as you mentioned, we basically had to reconfigure a whole division, um, but we also had to augment our communications team um, and bring people from other parts of the agency together. So we've, we've deployed a, a help desk and a a knowledge center which will allow us to and it has allowed us to handle a significant increase in the volume of communications and support requests that we received so we've done some of that through automation um, but i think the long the longer term implications are where we haven't begun to really assess i would expect uh, as i often say with uh, COVID, i think we're going to see uh, increased student needs and student support areas such as special education and so forth so as one end of the agency, uh, which might was involved with the uh, more immediate communications aspect of the emer emergency response, we'll see that transition to another section of the agency, uh, student support, special ed, and so forth become more urgent. Um, so it's really, it's kind of hard at this point to, to predict that. But um, I think, you know, yes, I would agree uh, the assessment uh, that I would see in the pattern is increased centralization on things like operations as part of our SSDDMS initiative, trying to pull in sort of the back office functions to the state level as best we can. And um, there'll be more, I think, continued decentralization of the curriculum expertise, which is something that started back in 2008 or so. Uh, but the back office things, I think, should be centralized at the state level and done more efficiently. If I could yeah. just, one more, um, kid, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Um, also, I, I'm looking at the vacancies that you, that you have uh, in finance, and half of them are actually related to special ed, I believe. And given that the annual OSEP uh, determination letter indicated that Vermont wasn't doing too well, and that we've actually moved to the level of intervention, um, which seems to me costly. <laughs> It's, it's not good for children, but it's also expensive. And so I, I'm balancing the, the, the challenge of, of having a, a department that is understaffed, um, possibly likely because the people you're looking for have advanced degrees. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm, I stand concerned about that. And I'm, I'm asking if that's a concern that you're carrying as well moving forward in relation to that OSEP letter. Yeah, I mean, I still, I balance that concern with um, us making progress on some of those fronts. The OSEP concerns are not new to us and really, from my perspective, the result of significant vacancies in our student supports division, including not having a state director of special education for some time. Uh, so as those programs come back online, we shouldn't be surprised to find the deficiencies. 
Um, but I, I prefer to just, you know, sort of advocate for our agency based on what the need is. I think the needs are changing. Uh, but I also know, um, you know, that, that agencies of education, the SEAs, if you will, are configured uh, differently across the country, but there are some similarities. I was talking with my colleague in Maine the other day. She has exactly the same number of employees that serve the whole state of Maine and uh, basically have twice as many students as Vermont. Uh, Connecticut has pretty much the same number of employees, a little higher, uh, but they serve 500,000 students. So it's, it's really hard to understand. I think what I've noticed is that we have, like most agencies, we have one person doing one thing. So when we have a turnover, we're very vulnerable uh, to that. Um, we haven't made pace with automating a lot of our practices. So we have antiquated technology that we're also trying to build modern technology with at the same time. So um, I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, but um, I think there's a lot, a lot we can do on the back office side to simplify things for the field and bring that into the agency. So I, for those that the, the appropriations committee might not be as familiar with SSDDMS initiative, which is a good example. This is the idea is to centralize the accounting and HR functions uh, into one system. Um, you know, it's been really problematic and challenging. I think that's moving forward okay now. But that concept uh, allows, you know, us to simplify the system overall, uh, meaning that we have one platform by which we can extract our data at the state level from and locals can use, and it saves licensing costs and software right across the board. So those kinds of things are where we need to go as much as we talk about staffing. I'm not so keenly interested in staffing antiquated uh, technology or antiquated processes. Um, I'm very interested in staffing modernization initiatives, and I think we're, we're making progress on those things, but it will take some time. But I think, you know, to the observation of comparing Maine to Vermont, uh, you know, we all have the same number of programs to administer, and that's why SEAs are as big as they are. So whether you're California or Vermont or Maine, you still have the same number of federal programs to administer. So uh, we're just going to have to learn to operate a little smarter, I think, in terms of modernizing how we uh, deal with information technology and how we work together as teams inside the agency. That's starting to that conversation. Yeah, it's all right. You, you're very familiar with us. <laughs> um, Secretary French, I, I, I understand that, you know, you, you need to support the governor's, um, you know, proposal and that you, you know, I know that you and your, your team really worked hard on finding these 3% savings. However, they were more a sign than organically, you know, came to the table as places where, um, you know, you, you could really make reductions and, and perhaps some of them were organic and, and you would have come up with them anyway. Instead of, um, you know, we understand, you know, the travel is probably an easy one, a small amount for supplies, you may be able to make things work. And you talked about the vacancy savings and moving in a different direction uh, with employees, not just about the number of employees, but what they do. Which one of which one of these reductions gives you a little unease or pain? Um, do you see any really having an impact on the administration of a program? And it didn't feel quite as easy um, as maybe another one does. Yeah, I would just you know start to. You know, as I've learned uh, as secretary, and as I would say as a superintendent who is an advocate for having the secretary be an appointee of the governor, um, part of this, the concept was that uh, the agency of education is not a separate entity, it's part of uh, all of, you know, the executive branch. So um, you know, the governor's proposal, quote unquote, is my recommended, my slice of it is my recommended budget as well. And I appreciate that. There isn't much here that doesn't give me unease, uh, particularly the programmatic sides. Uh, you know, as an educator, um, I'm, I'm focused on doing the best I can to protect uh, the program viability. And uh, I'm on, you know, the, the grant cuts that we've named, I don't feel good about any of those. You know, um, I know those programs, every single one of them outright Vermont, Governor's Institute, uh, the dual enrollment programs, those have proven to be very valuable programs in the state and we, we try to support them as best we can. But as you know very well that the budgets have to be balanced and those those issues have to be reconciled. Um, so, you know, to the point um, that Representative Webb made, I'm going to be very protective of maintaining the capacity I do have in the agency. Uh, because I do have, um, you know, stresses on that, and we have a lot of work to do, particularly with COVID. Um, so I, I don't want to lose positions at this point. So I'm doing the best I can to, to strike those balances. But I think my instinct would tell me uh, that we're in for 
um, an era where we have to be tighter on things and it's, it's going to be very challenging for you and for us to uh, strike the right balance. But I think that's precisely the time we're in. So I've been in budgeting exercises, quote unquote, where you receive targets from school boards or or from a finance office and so forth. And that's not an invalid way to start a budget process uh, because at least it, it kind of gives you some flexibility or you know where the touch points are where you start to get discomfort. Um, but I feel I feel very comfortable with what we're proposing. I am, I think the the program, the, the grants are, you know, those are those are things I wouldn't feel good about regardless. Uh, but I think those kinds of things have to be uh, addressed uh, rationally in the context of living within our means. And I think it's going to be time for a little belt belt tightening, if you will, on the programs. And um, so we endeavor to to get our agency in sync with the time, so to speak, in that regard. I'm sorry, I was muted. We have a, re a question from Representative Conlon and Representative James. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, among those that give me unease is the uh, cut to dual enrollment. I think that that has been a, a program with increasing demand. And I would actually have the concern that as um, students with, with online learning becoming so prevalent that students are no longer limited by distance to campus, that actually the demand for dual enrollment, which as you say is an entitlement, is actually going to grow. And I'm not sure how we balance that growth with a proposed 3% cut. Yeah, I, you know, as I, we've talked in your committee briefly on this, I think we need to get clear on the policy intention of dual enrollment. Um, you know, I think the intention was to subsidize those students, particularly first generation students who would have otherwise difficulty accessing higher education. Um, and to focus on their needs. Um, I think if we do that, we will we'll find a different way to live within uh, the budget, so to speak. Uh, but we know there are significant patterns in, in, in inequity uh, in access to dual enrollment. And what we've seen, I think the agencies provided at least two years of uh, reporting on this, if not three years, that uh, those who probably don't need the subsidy are taking advantage of it more so than those that probably do need it. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to solve that problem, though, for the FY21 budget. Thank you, Representative Conlon. Representative James, your hand was up and then it was down. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you. Secretary French, I, I just, um, I, I know you already addressed um, you know, your unease with the, with the size of the cut to outright Vermont. And I wondered if you considered at all um, a smaller budget cut. I, I was just out with my calculator and, and noticing that, you know, a, a cut to one small nonprofit equates to almost 8% of, of your overall budget reductions. And, you know, we've been, we've been reading that um, nonprofits in particular are having a hard time um, maybe accessing some of the grants that we made available. Um, through the CRF funds because they're not seeing necessarily those revenue reductions, um, you know, in, in the time period, you know, they're not necessarily seeing that 50% revenue reduction in the time period that we, um, the, the legislature required. And nonprofits may also be having a hard time raising money through their annual um, fundraising campaigns that are, that often come up in the fall. And so it seems to me that nonprofits, um, are in a particular, um, they're in a particularly difficult position sometimes, um, or maybe this year they're, they're um, not often access, you know, they can't access the grants uh, through the ACCD. They might have a tough time um, this fall raising private philanthropic dollars and a, a $40,000 cut, you know, in the context of an overall five, $500,000 um, reduction in the AOE seems like a big hit. And I wondered if you guys considered a smaller re reduction for outright. No, I think the, uh, you know, to my point earlier, I, I probably didn't say this fluently, their typical, um, the money they received from us, once again, passed through from the federal government was $20,000. So uh, from our perspective, this brings it back to what their typical uh, amount of revenue was. I think the the $60,000, we didn't really have a part in uh, putting that together. That was done outside of an agency recommendation. 
uh, through the legislative process. Uh, so 60 was an anomaly, if you will, in terms of that support. I think also what's an anomaly in, in this regard is we don't, we're not really sure, uh, we don't have any assurance or sort of direct policy direction on what they're supposed to achieve with those dollars. Uh, so we have many, 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 uh, you know, nonprofits in the state doing great work, but we don't necessarily just give them money without some assurance of providing a service. So, for example, typically, and I would expect the a lot of the work that uh, Outright does is probably going to be increased uh, as we go into the recovery of COVID-19. Uh, the data we're seeing from um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey indicates that many of the students they serve are probably more vulnerable uh, due to the stresses that we're seeing as a result of the emergency. So we're gonna have need for additional services, but typically we would put out an RFP for those services and other agencies or other organizations, I would say would compete, but would submit proposals and also identify the scope of the work they would do and what are the measures uh, that we would know. But this kind of appropriation where we weren't really involved in it and we, we really don't know to what extent the money's being utilized. I'm sure they're doing great work because I work with them all the time, but we don't have a, any kind of measure of, of how the work is going and we don't have any uh, oversight of, of ensuring that the money is being spent in accordance with the policy direction because there is no policy direction attached to it. That's helpful, thanks. Thank you. Um, I be, I'm paying attention to time. I want to be um, con, you know, considerate of, of your time. And is this our last slide, Bill, or is there one more below this slide? So this is the last slide as, as it relates to the, the budget exercise. I did add a couple of slides at the end just to highlight the summary of the carry forward requests. But okay. that is above and beyond the, the budget conversation. So this, this particular slide, the ups and down deeper dive was the last one of the, uh, the budget. Okay, so out of your carry forward, um, the 20,000 of carry forward, you reverted uh, six point, out of the 20 million, you reverted 6.2? So there's two slides. I couldn't fit this on one slide without straining my eyes. And so slide 13 and 14, slide 13 has a subtotal of 6.2, and then slide 14 has another subtotal of the reversion of 7.8 which is a total of 14. And that is made up of the individual line items that we, we see on both of these pages. Okay, so state place student, you had, um, I'm just taking the first one, you had a carry forward of a million dollars and, and out of that 1 million, I wanna make sure I'm reading this correctly, you reverted back 3.3. We're, we're going to carry forward a million, and then we're reverting 3.3. That's right. And, and so um, you're, you're keeping uh, 6.7. No, uh, 600 and... No, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not reading this correctly. The carry yeah. forwards are separate from the reversions. Yes. Okay, so out of the carry forwards, how much of the carry forwards do you get to keep and how much are reverted back to um, the administration to be to go out elsewhere? And we're just talking uh, state place students as an example at the top of slide 14. And we're asking that we carry forward $1 million for mm -hmm. FY20 obligation. And yes. then the remaining balance or 3.3 million is getting reverted back. Can I just, so in other words, you had 4.3 million in okay. carry forward total. We were asking to carry forward 1 million and we're reverting back to 3.3, yes. So the total of it was the 4.3. Four. And that four. makes it, yes. Okay, four point, okay, so with uh, education spending grants, you're reverting the, the full amount. Yes, so when, when Kathy, Brad and I took a look at the, and the year balances we took into consideration all right do we have any outstanding purchase orders do we have any anticipated uh, fy20 obligations that we'll, we'll want to make sure we have enough money available for mm -hmm. the balance is uh, what we're recommending that we revert back okay just so i'm reading this correctly when we get to the subtotal yep. of carry forwards you are carrying forward within your own budget 2.65 million. 
you're keeping it. You're not reverting. You're not reverting any of that back. You're keeping that full carry forward. Right. That amount. The reversions that go back into the overall budget are 7.88. On this particular page, yes. On this page. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was reading it correctly. Yes. Um, can we see the next page? Do you uh, want to get into as far as detail on the purchase orders or the carryovers? Or carry yeah, what are the purchase orders? I don't. Do we have detail on that, Kathy? Um, I don't have any detail other than saying a purchase order would have been created for us to um, bring FY20 funds forward against contractual obligations. So a purchase order is created in the state's accounting system to obligate funds to pay for contract obligations. So the biggest share of that, if you see, is the Finance and Administration Education Fund. That is a contractual obligation to our contractor who is managing the SSDDMS project, which is um, funded by the Ed Fund. So all of the purchase orders are dollars that you need to keep to pay for those obligations. Exactly. Okay. The carry forward is also money that you are keeping to carry forward for similar expenses or expenses in another area. Yes, the bulk the of those are grant obligations. Okay, and then the reversions are, are the totals that have gone back into the larger pool to be distributed throughout state government. Correct. Okay, I, we have two questions. We have uh, one from Kimberly, I believe. Uh, thank you. I'm looking at slide 13, and I noted that the Ethnic and Social Advisory Group has a reversion of about 15,000. And I'm remembering that, I think, is Act 1. Was there a delay or another explanation for that? Um, I don't know about a delay. Secretary French may be able to um, respond to that. But those were allocated for per diems that were the dot where the dollars were not ultimately um, requested by any of the committee members. And because there is a new allocation of funds for FY21, we're able to revert the FY20 remaining balance. Yeah, I would, I would concur. Uh, my understanding is that the appropriation was tied to their per diem rates and the committee uh, the advisor group uh, took longer to organize themselves and select their members than was anticipated. So they did not meet for quite some time. Are they on track now? Yes. Great. Thank you. And funded in 21. Is that correct? I believe correct. so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mary Hooper, do you have a question? Mary? I thought I saw your hand up, Mary. Yeah, I did, and I muted and unmuted and muted myself. Um, I, I think we've run out of time, or we're on the verge of running out of time, but in the proposed, in the carry forwards and reversion sheets, there's some pretty significant amounts of money that we're talking about. And um, it strikes me that we ought to dig into these a little deeper to understand why funds weren't allocated. In particular, I'm looking at the special ed formula where we've, we're looking at a total of $24 million that wasn't spent in 20. And I think we, we ought to understand that. I, mean, I, I don't know what the special ed budget I line is in total, but that's a lot of money. And similarly, I'm, I'm technical ed, you know, two point, I, I shouldn't try to do math, 2.3 million that wasn't spent. And again, we ought to understand why. Um, yeah, they're, they're I think so, I may be asking the ed committee and CHIP to dig into this. Mm -hmm. These are very also, very similar to dual enrollment. The bottom line is we don't know how the programs will end. So special ed obviously is an entitlement program. So 
we budget based on a service plan work that districts do a year. They're about to do that now to predict what their special ed costs will be next year. But we never know until the fiscal year ends actually what the actual special ed costs are. So there's always going to be those kinds of variations in special education. And I would, I would argue dual enrollment's the same way. It's an entitlement program. So we, we go with what we know to perform a budget, but we're not quite sure what the ultimate cost would be. Yeah, I think special ed is one of the places where it really is an anomaly. And Brad could speak to some of the specifics of it, but we carried a large chunk of ed fund into current year on purpose because with the anticipation of um, special ed moving to the block process, block grant um, system, which has now been delayed. Like there, there was an anticipation that there's gonna be sort of this payoff of a large tail um, in the next year. So we wanted to make sure we carried over enough money for that to happen. And now the special ed is not going to be um, converted to the block system until another two years, Brad. But I know there is some there is some level of detail that Brad could speak to for the special ed. I, yeah. I, I've got it uh, because we're so close on time. I, I want to continue this conversation with with Chip for our committee and also let the committee of jurisdiction dig into some of these uh, details that we have. We have, if there are two quick questions, and I, I want to be respectful, uh, Secretary, of your time. Uh, Representative Iacovoni and Conquest each have a question, and if they can be answered quickly, let's do that. And if not, um, we will have Chip follow up. So Dave, why don't you go first, and then we'll finish with Chip. Thank you. I'll be quick. Quick and uh, Secretary, this may be something you may want to get back to me on, just given the time constraints. Um, I'm I'm concerned about children with special education needs, their supervision and safety needs at home in this remote uh, learning environment, and wonder to what degree you're able to coordinate with AHS around these most vulnerable students and our school districts to utilize and maximize what some of us call the success beyond six program and leveraging those federal dollars with our designated agencies to provide those supports. Is this something on your radar? Um, and, it, and could you share with me um, offline if need be what you may be doing in this area? Oh, happy to absolutely on the front, almost on the front burner now. I think goal one is to get schools reopened, uh, but we're having a lot of conversations with the DSAs. I mean, right now, getting schools reopened is our biggest intervention uh, that we can introduce. But we know uh, there's going to be significant immediate need uh, to support students as a result of the crisis, and this will probably continue for some time um, after we uh, achieve some sort of normalcy in education. But happy to follow up with you. Thank you, Dave, and, and please share you. what you learn with our committee and also with the, with, um, with the Committee of Jurisdiction. And Chip, do you, um, do you have a question or yeah. a comment? Well, I, I was going to save it, but I'll just say real quickly that um, I, I've always been, every year I have looked at the reversions and thought, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. And every year I ask Brad about it, and it turns out to be exactly what Secretary French said, that uh, a lot of it is just sort of the unpredictability of how much of the the fund is going to be used, how much demand there's going to be. Um, I'm happy to ask Brad again this year if there's anything that stand out, um, and maybe this can be my uh, my asking him now if there's any any particular area that's unusual. But this is these reversions, in my experience, are not not out of line with the way it usually happens. So I'll look into it more, but I don't expect to find that there's anything frankly unusual. Thank you, Chip. And, and what you find out when we um, when we hear back from the Education Committee, that, that would be a good time to weigh in with those pieces. Um, I, I want to thank um, the Secretary and the whole team from the Education um, Agency coming in. And with your budget, this is, I mean, it's a very tender time, as David Giacovoni said with children not being able to attend schools or attend schools part-time or some families that are doing it remotely, 
what does it mean for the child? What's the pressure it's going to cause in the future? And there are endless questions about education out there and um, the impact, the negative impact, as, as well as maybe new learning opportunities. But mostly I think we're, we're just very concerned what this is meaning for our, our learners, especially the young ones who cannot spend a lot of time um, on a screen and uh, get what they need. And, and so these reductions are concerning. And what I would ask the, um, the education committee, we are not going to send a letter um, like we typically do because time is so short. And so as you work through uh, the reductions and changes, um, we look forward to as soon as possible, a letter of recommendation. And if you would invite Representative Conquest into some of your deliberations, it would help um, coordinate these activities and, um, and then we can continue our questioning with, with the agency and the secretary as well. Um, our turnaround time is going to be approximately or less than two weeks. And so this is all expedited and um, to find any of the language and any of the documents, please access the JFO website. Um, if there's something in particular you need to find, uh, Teresa is really great. And thank you, Teresa and Maria, getting information out to you. Um, but this is, this is the new format that we're going to kind of work as a team. We'll work through CHIP and CHIP will bring information back to us. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Secretary, we will work on a meeting with you um, very soon. <laughs> Well, thank you for your thoughtful questions. I know our team appreciates that level of scrutiny and uh, we'll look forward to working with you in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you. And we know the challenges, especially in this area, are great and they're only going to be greater. Dave, did you have a final thought? Your hand is up. I'm good. I apologize. Okay. So um, unless there's anything else from... Um, the, from anyone within the agency or anyone with from house education any anything that we need to follow up on or well, there's a lot we need to follow up on but anything else that needs to be asked at this time then I think that we're going to close this session out and and thank you uh, Secretary French for coming in and for your testimony and Bill for all the financial information I'm looking around the screen it's uh, it's so they jump around on me and and Kathy as well, thank you. Candace, we didn't hear from you. Candace, you are, your position is just so that we know, I, I don't know because I don't work with education as much. That's okay, Chair Toll, thank you. I'm um, actually with the administration and budget and management, but education is my assignment. Okay, so that's, okay, thank you. All right, um, then we look forward to recommendations and um, figuring out um, if these reductions are something we all get comfortable with or if there's changes we feel need to be made. I am going to sign out from YouTube then, so our official business is